I was quite inspired by uh, when I saw the Dalai Lama and he gave his talk on the Saturday and he said, oh yes, I'm supposed to talk about compassion. Now, what am I going to say? How am I going to talk about compassion? Wait, wait, let me, let me think for a minute. And then he sort of thought about it for a minute and then he said, okay, well, I'll start talking. So then he started talking. So I thought that was very nice that, that uh, he also takes a spontaneous attitude to his Dhamma teachings. There's always so many different aspects of things to talk about. I'm supposed to be preparing for this conference in Hamburg and, and uh, I've just realized to my absolute horror that they want us to prepare a speech which has got to be exactly 15 minutes long. And this is their Germans, right? So 15 minutes means 15 minutes. It doesn't mean 15 minutes and 5 seconds. It means 15 minutes. And I have to actually read it out. It's revolting. Why, why bother even going? I could just make a PDF file of it and they can just do the, like the mechanical voice on the PDF thing and they can just do a voice synthesized version. I think it would probably be much better. Certainly cheaper. Anyway, maybe what I'd like to talk about today is something that I've been thinking about the last few days and uh, uh, maybe, maybe share with you some, some of my thoughts, kind of fairly random thoughts about uh, <clears throat> where like religion and culture and religion and, and uh, especially our culture here in Australia, what we're doing with it and where we're going. So to rather than, rather than kind of delving into the like immediacy of religious experience, but also to step back a little bit and, and to reflect on what, what kind of thing it is that we're doing and where it fits in with, with uh, our life and the life of people in Australia. I mentioned just before the talk that at this uh, uh, forum I went to the other day that, that uh, there was a whole day of, of people, you know, at a very kind of high level forum, like the top representatives of religious groups from all around Australia, talking about religion. And, you know, everything was very nice and, you know, I don't really have any much to criticise with the content of what people said. They were certainly all working forward in a very, in a very um, positive way. You know, they wanted to, to, to help each other. There wasn't, the people weren't slagging off different religions and weren't arguing about things, but they wanted to try to use religion as a constructive force in Australia. And yet, um, there was no uh, real uh, acknowledgement at all of any kind of interior dimension to religion. The only, and I sort of commented on that during the forum, the only exception to that was just uh, a brief, shortly after I made my comment and there was a, a, a little, little Hindu nun, old nun of some kind, I'm not really sure, but, and uh, when she spoke she had a very, a very peaceful and very kind of genuine or, or kind of a depth, you could see there was a spiritual depth to what she was saying. And that was the only point in the conference where I kind of felt that, and uh, which was kind of a shame. And I remember kind of looking around at all the people and what they had to say, and it was all very intelligent and very reasonable and very worthy in that. And I remember kind of, kind of thinking to myself, do I want to be like that? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be like that, and I don't want Buddhism to be like that. I don't think that... It's like, why bother? If, if that's what it's going to be, then why bother being a Buddhist? You know? There's not, you kind of, you know, you might as well be anything else, ist. You know, you can be, be Anglican or Baptist or whatever. And uh, that's <coughs> equally as good. That'll perform a similar role in the society and, and, and create social cohesion is the, the kind of the buzzword. which is all very fine, but it's, it's so politicized I find it difficult to get excited about it. So what's actually Buddhism going to provide to that uh, and one of the things which I guess struck me, which was like a, a kind of a, a, um, a subtext of the whole thing was, of course it's all post 9-11, which is a kind of an inescapable context and post 9-11 means that 
radical extremist fundamentalism, violent fundamentalism has been raised to our conscious, especially obviously associated with the Muslims, but we also realize that similar currents are found in other religions, even though they're perhaps not so well publicized. And this, um, and that has fueled a kind of increasing uh, uh, um, vitality, if you like, in the age-old kind of war between religion and science. Yeah? And of course you've got Richard Dawkins and, and all the rest of them putting out books which very kind of aggressively uh, attacking uh, kinds of religion and, and any kind of religion and all kinds of uh, stories and so on circulating around about this and, and mo many of the stories kind of reaching the status of urban legends, urban myths and one of them I heard recently was that one myth was that Richard Dawkins apparently, and I think this is probably an urban myth, apparently asked an air hostess to not wear a crucifix as it insulted his intelligence. <laughs> I'm sure that's probably an urban myth. I hope so anyway. And uh, so we've got this kind of much more aggressive kind of war between the, the uh, uh, different religions. I guess when I was growing up, it wasn't so much of a, uh, an item, an agenda. Uh, sometimes I check out the uh, Guardian newspaper uh, to see what's happening in the world. And uh, you, know, you can see on the, um, the you know, Guardian's a fairly, you know, it's one of the most popular newspapers in the world. And the website, I think, is perhaps, I think the website might be the most popular uh, website of a newspaper in the world. And it has... Uh, on the, the blogs and it has, you know, different, you can feed back and it gives you the number of feedbacks. And whenever it's talking about these issues, you know, whenever it has one of these atheists getting up and giving a rant, it always has much more comments, hundreds of comments, much more than any other topic. Yeah? And it's, it's generating huge amounts of interest and huge amounts of debate. And uh, so th that's very interesting. It's something which seemed to have cooled down, I guess, perhaps 20 or 30 years ago, the, the secularists had more or less won out in, in the academic realm and were doing their thing and that was sort of and the, the kind of the mainstream religions were sort of doing their thing uh, but it wasn't there wasn't so much of an intersection between them whereas now that's become much more uh, there's much more friction happening much more action happening which is kind of interesting but it's not particularly um, I don't feel it's particularly interesting in, in a, in a, in a um, I mean, it's interesting in a social sense. I don't think it's interesting in a, in a philosophical sense. It doesn't seem to me that there's any actual new ideas coming out of that, or at least I haven't seen any. It's just a rehashing of, of very old arguments, mm -hmm. uh, which for myself, I went over most of those arguments when I was uh, uh, at university, and, and I can't really see anything else uh, you know, coming out of that. So we've got this kind of vitality. So on the one hand, more, more aggressive attacks on religion, but also more aggressive defense of religion. And, and of course, the, the, the encroachment where, where religion has tried to sell itself as intelligent design and all of these kinds of things. And uh, it's, it, it seems to me that there, when, when, when we're talking, when we're talking at this, this conference, the... The, the, the position seemed to be, or the, 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 the con, I don't know, consensus, but anyway, the position which was voiced was that, you know, there's been a revitalization of interest in religion, which I'm not sure if that's true. I think perhaps there's less people inhabiting the, com the, the, the kind of the gray middle ground where they're not going to say anything about it, perhaps more people actually, more people defined, I don't know if more people are getting interested in religion as such. But it seemed to me that the, 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 the agendas that were driving it, the things that were driving it, were, were still very much defensive and very much reactive. And this is something which I'm, I've been kind of trying to think about and trying to, to formulate for myself. I'm perhaps not very clear in my own ideas, so maybe get some more, more feedback from others about this. It seemed to me that the, 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 the religious ideas that were being put across or being put across by religious people were trying to 
get religion accepted within a secular values system. Okay, so intelligent design is, is, is a classic idea, a classic example of that. You know, cl intelligent design is, is a, as, as far as I can see, a political phenomenon where, where in America, because you can't teach religion in schools and they try to dress up creationism as a scientific theory so it can actually be taught in, in schools. I mean, it seems to me that's where intelligent design is about. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, theology or, or genuine Christian ideas. But, of course, once you try to do that, you're kind of admitting that you've lost the battle because you're trying to say that the, the, the logic is religion is good because really it's science, right? which is admitting that science is a higher value system which is capable of judging religion. So as soon as you start to do that, you've, you've lost the, the battle straight away. Okay? And it seems to me that this is what's been happening with these... these these religious agendas in one way or another that were being put forth at this conference. For example, it was like, like religion is, is, can be a positive force. So they were like counteracting the negative image of religion, which had come out of 9-11 and the extremists and fundamentalists and saying, no, 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 religion can be a positive force, social force for cohesion. Right? Now, again, the very fact that you're saying that is almost like an admission of defeat because why are you saying that? Well, you're obviously saying that because most people can't see that or because many people actually really can't acknowledge that religion is a positive force otherwise you wouldn't be asserting that and you're, you're, you're responding to that challenge which has arisen why has that challenge arisen why, is, why are people questioning religion in that way I'll give a point of comparison you know we think about 9-11 was of course motivated partly by religion, okay? So religion was one of the causal factors in that. Now, another causal factor in 9-11 was, of course, technology, okay? You had to be able to get a plane and fly it into the, to the World Trade Centers. Nobody comes along and says, therefore, technology is bad because it creates machines which are capable of wreaking such havoc, okay? It's just as logical, actually. It's one of the causal factors, and if you didn't have planes, you wouldn't have had the big tall buildings for a start <laughs> you could say you could say well if we we're all living in tents then you can't do that kind of thing you know <clears throat> so this is just as it's just as logical but nobody actually brings these kinds of arguments up why not well it seems to me because the, the advantages of technology and the success of science is so obvious right that we we all we all know that we all can switch on an electric light we see the results of it and not, none of us want to go backwards uh, and, and, and live in the kind of caveman era. So, so the, the, the successes and the, the positive side of science and technology is so obvious and so widely accepted that when, when the negative side of it is revealed, science and technology itself is not questioned. And the same thing happens in, in many other spheres, like you know, with global warming or the, the war in Iraq or whatever. And there are massive things that science does which which causes harm, incredible harm on an incredibly wide scale. And technology has produced tremendous suffering for people. And yet no one goes around questioning the value, or very few people question the value of technology as such. Of course, we might want to redesign or reinvent it or adapt it or whatever or develop new technologies or something. But nobody's going around and saying we should get rid of technology. Only a very, very small minority. But that's not like a major debate within the community. Whereas with religion, it is a major debate in the community. The major question is, do we need religion at all? Can we just throw it out the window? And so it seems to me that, that this perspective which was being developed was that, well, one of the reasons why we don't throw religion out the window is because it adds to social cohesion. It holds communities together. Okay? It, perform, it creates social capital. There's hospitals which are you know, founded because of, uh, you know, with a religious perspective. There are community groups. There are old folks' homes. There are, you know, just meetings like the meeting today where people come together and meet us in, in, in a group and create social networks and so on and so forth. Religion does all of this kind of thing, improving the social capital. Therefore, it's something good. Uh, therefore, this is, this is showing how worthwhile religion is. And I think that argument is complete failure and is almost like an embarrassment to religion. Of course, it's true. It's not that it's not true. But it's got nothing to do with religion. The same thing applies to basketball. Right? Basketball also ca creates social capital. It also brings people together. It also unifies communities. Yeah? 
the, the ladies' auxiliary at the local primary school also does the same thing. Yeah? There are a million kinds of social networking and social groups which actually bring people together and create social cohesion. And religion is only one of those. And I would speculate and I would suggest... I don't think that actually religion is like a major or, 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 or particularly crucial force in that regard in Australian culture. And maybe I'm mistaken here, but you, you, know, you sort of relativise it or compare it with other cultures. If we look at more traditional cultures, well, then you can see that, yes, people were very much unified by their religious faith. If we look back in medieval times or something like that, people would get together. It was their faith, which, which in faith in God, which, or faith in the Buddha or whatever it might be, that really held the community together and gave them a set of shared values. So that set of shared values, they derived primarily from their religion, okay, and that enabled them to bond the society together. And that's one of the things which, which is uh, very uh, crucial for creating a society, a set of shared values, which is a different thing from actually living those values. You know, you might go into a Buddhist culture where all everyone's going and, and fishing and shooting and killing and killing animals and, and drinking and getting drunk and all of these kinds of things. And then they come along to the temple once a week and take the five precepts, yes, I'll refrain from killing living beings and yes, I'll refrain from drinking alcohol intoxicants and so on. They don't keep the rules, okay? They don't keep precepts. It never crosses their mind to keep precepts. You talk, you talk, it's, it's completely alien to them. What do you mean keeping precepts? There's monks, monks keep precepts, you know? If you talk to the monks, they say, well, yes, we keep precepts, but we've got 227. If we leave, lose a few of them, then never mind. We've got plenty left, right? <laughs> so so who, who's keeping the precepts? But what it is, it's giving them a shared value system. Even though they might say, well, yes, I, don't, I can't live by those rules, right? But still, they're, good, they're a good thing. And as a community, they, they're, they're, they're a shared value thing. They appreciate it. They respect it. And for us, in our society, I don't think that's the case anymore. I don't think that uh, religions are really creating the shared value system which is making Australian society possible. I don't think it's got anything to do with it. I think our shared value system is derived from the Enlightenment the, the, in Europe and from the Western values of freedom and equality and democracy and liberty and all of those kinds of things. And our kind of belief in that we can sort of form together as a rational group of people and make a contract and make a constitution and create institutions which are going to govern within a reasonably just and fair manner and, and all of these kinds of things. And I think that's actually, belief in those things is what's holding Australian society together. And religion could fade out of the scene altogether, okay, as a social force, and I don't think it would seriously make any difference. I think if, 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 if Christians weren't running the Christian Red Cross and saying because of historical or whatever Christian groups there may be, charities, maybe historically, yes, they've been formed because they've come from a Christian background, but if that Christian element of them was gone away, it wouldn't stop people from being charitable. It wouldn't stop people from being generous. They'd be just as charitable as they are with Christianity around. And I don't think it would make very much difference. Of course, it would make a difference in the details, right, of how things would work out. But the general principle, I don't think, would make much difference. So I'm not, I'm not proposing this as a, as, a, as a dogma or anything. This is just something I've been thinking of. And this is something I've, I've been wondering. Would it, does it really matter all that much? So just, ex, just taking that as a hypothesis to start with, what then is the implication for our religious life? If it's really the case that religion is not really particularly relevant in terms of, of creating societies and building, building the actual culture that we live in, then, then what, if anything, is the relevance of religion? And of course, if you look at the, the, what we call the neo-atheists, and they say, well, religion doesn't have any rele relevance. It's based on a set of metaphysical propositions which are in fact false and which were developed for, for various kind of evolutionary reasons and so on and which are now outdated, they're now dysfunctional and religion is better off to abandon it, doesn't have any function. So that's one kind of viewpoint. 
Unfortunately, Buddhism is a little bit of a, uh, a bugbear in that system, as, as Richard Dawkins actually acknowledges in his book, that, that um, Buddhism doesn't really come within the scope of his critique of religions. And uh, re Buddhism is not based on a set of metaphysical propositions about things. But even leaving, leaving that particular dilemma to one side, you could still ask, well, what's the, 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 the relevant... Is a religion a thing, the kind of thing which is actually based... Mm -hmm. or, or which, which the assent to or belief in a set of propositions, a set of doctrinal propositions, is particularly important? Okay? Is, the, is that, in fact, the case? Of course, it's, it seems to be the case, and it's often presented that, that that's the case, but is that, in fact, the case? Is, is, is a belief in one set of propositions right or wrong or actually central to people's religious life. So perhaps, I think it has some importance, but I think perhaps it's less important than uh, we sometimes uh, assume it to be. So, you know, I'm obviously I'm, I'm, as a Buddhist monk, I'm someone who does believe that there's a very important role for, for religious or for spiritual life, so I don't uh, except Dawkins' argument that religion is just useless and should be thrown out. And yet I do agree with his basic idea that, that uh, you know, theses like the, the, the God and the eternal soul and these kinds of things are in fact uh, false and uh, that we can, we can, we're better off to live without them. I mean, I'm not going to try to hammer these home and try to convince people who don't want to be convinced of them. Um, but... Nevertheless, I basically agree that it, that that's, that is the case. Although, I, I, just as a, as a point of fact, I don't believe in I don't accept Dawkins's arguments. I don't think are particularly good to establish the non-existence of God. But I agree with the conclusion. So, what then is the role of of religion if it's not if we if we if we accept which I think is you know, completely obvious that religions do not hand down a body of a kind of, you know, unquestioned black and white literal truth, which is how, you know, the, the final once and for all explanation for the universe, okay, and that that's locked up in some ancient book. Okay, we, we don't believe that, okay, we'll throw, put fundamentalism to one side. The argument from social cohesion is, yes, it's, it's kind of true, but it's a bit trivial, and it's not really it's not it's not sufficient to make religion really worthwhile in our society. What then is the role of religion, and what are we actually doing here? So it seems to me that there's some kind there's something missing. There's some aspect of of religious life and what it means to be practicing a religious faith or a spiritual faith, which is not uh, really accounted for in in these kinds of positions, and which is which somehow is is more essential or more important. And I think some of those aspects of what religious life is uh, are quite uh, straightforward. I think um, one aspect is that religious life gives us, in some sense, an aspiration or a, um, a context of something which is uh, beyond or transcendent, something which is not... Uh, bound up with the kind of the murkiness, the ambiguity, the suffering, uh, the complexities and everything of this world which is so imperfect and so devastating in, in the breadth and the depth of its suffering. So there's, that's, that's one thing that religion gives us which is very important. How we, how we conceptualize that and how that rele that's relevant for us is varies from religion to religion, but they all have some idea that there's something which can somehow elevate us. And this is where I had the difference from my theistic uh, brothers and sisters at the conference because they would talk, they'd use words, they'd say, well, we're all one under one God. And it's like, you know, if you want to really, really annoy Buddhists and just say, <laughs> start talking about we're all, we're all, we're all the same because we all believe in one God. It was actually my first encounter with a multi-faith Oh no, two. My first two encounters in multi-faith dialogue. One was when I was in Malaysia, and before I was a monk. And uh, but after I'd done my first retreat, and I went down there, and I was staying in a house uh, there of a uh, professor, 
And as it happened in the house, he had a couple of guests also staying there who were from Libya on a student exchange program. And uh, we were talking, they didn't know I was a Buddhist, and so they said, oh yes, you know, Buddha, uh, I, Muslims and Christians are, are you know, really pretty much the same, aren't they? You know, we really believe in pretty much the same kind of thing, not like those Buddhists. <laughs> so I said, oh, just, just by the way, I'm a Buddhist, actually. So they were a bit shocked at that. And so that was my first experience of, of interfaith dialogue. The second one was when I went to Wat Manachat and um, soon after I arrived there at the monastery and I was still, still as a layman and there were a group of Christians who had come to stay in the monastery and do some meditation and stuff and one, one evening we just sort of had a, had a sort of sharing session and sat around and talked about our faiths and what we believed and the different aspects to our religion and so on and so forth and, and uh, at the end of it I remember at the end of this dialogue, it was all very nice, it was all kind of warm and fuzzy and we were all kind of explaining our views and everything. At the end of it, one of the Christian people said something along the lines of, well, you know, in the end, we're, we're all pretty much the same because we all believe in, in a saviour. We all believe that somebody is going to come along and, and save us from our suffering. And all the Buddhists, the Buddhists there were just kind of looked at each other and said, what? <laughs> it's a complete waste of time, you know. We've been sitting here talking for the last two hours and it's a total waste of time. So that was my first two attempts at multi-faith dialogue, and, uh, but I still persevere in the hope that we can get somewhere. So we, we have some kind of idea, and I think that's, that's quite a good starting point. And uh, in, in, uh, there's a very good, good uh, uh, saying on that made by Morris Walsh when he was discussing the nature of Nibbāna. And he said that when you look at how the Buddha talks about Nibbāna, he always calls Nibbāna as the unborn, the unconditioned, the unmade, the uncreated. And he said if you, if you were to, to look in a theistic perspective, they also would describe God in the same way. So God would also be described as unborn, unmade, uncreated, yeah? uncompounded. But they would typically also want to add other attributes to God. And it's those other attributes which Buddhists would find unacceptable. So they would also they want to say Buddha, that, that, that God is uncreated, but also that he's the creator of the universe. And so this is what we find to be incoherent from a Buddhist, Buddhist perspective, the uncreated creator or that he's, he's uncreated but somehow is acting as a personal uh, uh, agent and so on and so forth. So those so extra attributes which are added to the idea of God which from a Buddhist point of view are generally found to be unacceptable and that would be the point of difference there. But nevertheless, I think all the religions do share that kind of dimension like a transcendental dimension and that's something which can... I think, still meaningfully in, inform our spiritual lives and our actual, our actual spiritual and psychological development. And so, you know, regardless of um, uh, truth claims, okay, which religion is true or which religion is not, I think it's, I think it's clear and I think it's obvious that, that uh, religions, all religions can provide a meaningful framework for spiritual development and for spiritual evolution. And I think that it's that the Dalai Lama is probably quite true that for most people it's you're better off to to stay within the religion of your birth, okay? Although you're not actually born in a religion, and I think Richard Dawkins is quite right there to say you shouldn't speak of someone who's born as a Christian or born as a Buddhist because you're not born as anything; you're born as a baby, <laughs> and you don't believe in anything until you've grown up a bit. But uh, you tend to be to be born up with brought up with certain cultural assumptions and so on. I think for most people, that it's fine for them to 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 keep going with that. Uh, but if you find that those that culture that religion in the culture that you've been brought up with is unsatisfactory and you can't accept it anymore, as I did, you reject it. Okay, well that's when you need to start looking for for other alternatives. So within any, any religious framework, I think you can find some kind of transcendental dimension, some kind of deeper meaning or higher meaning in life. And this is going to kind of inform everything else you do. And for me, this was the dimension which I think is very important, but which kind of got lost in, 
in, in that conference. We didn't hear anybody speaking of these kinds of things. We heard people speaking of very practical things. Well, how do you teach about different religious ideas in schools? And, you know, how do you target the schools and how do you persuade them to do these things and so on? And it was very, it was very kind of pragmatic in that way. But there wasn't any talk about how do you actually create and raise the level of spiritual awareness and consciousness within a society, within a community. Nobody mentioned that. It wasn't, that wasn't part of the agenda, which was, I think, a bit sad. And I think that there are some you know, practical things that we can do that would be both um, like immediately useful and pragmatic, but also would help us to, to keep that kind of dimension, that kind of transcendental dimension in our, in our lives. You know, some simple things like doing, doing short meditations every day and these kinds of ideas can, can be used. It's not, it doesn't have to be anything which is too, too dramatic. But I remember when I was at school, you know, I was brought up as a Catholic and, and uh, um, went to a Catholic school for seven years. You know, we were supposed to, you know, we had religion classes and honestly we never learned anything in our religion classes. a complete waste of time. It was so wishy-washy and meaningless that, you know, it was exactly the opposite of the kind of the religion that you expect to get, the kind of classic Catholic kind of dogma, dogma, dogma kind of thing you read. I remember I, used to, I read um, James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man and it has these horrific descriptions where he would go along to his Irish Catholic school day after day and it was like, you know, all these schoolboys and, and you're teaching them going in detail through all of the agonies of hell, right? And so you go, every day you'd come in and the teacher would focus on a different kind of, of the particular agony that you would experience, be experiencing in hell and would go in great detail to elaborate on that one. And then you come back the next day and it would go on and on and on and on, going through each of the senses, how they're all oppressed by, by the suffering in hell and on and on and on. And then right at the end it leads up to, and the worst kind of suffering that you get in hell is the suffering of knowing that it's your fault. And you had the chance... <laughs> to do better but you didn't and so that's it it's entirely your fault and it's like the worst thing so this was the kind of classic kind of cliched Catholic education my Catholic education was so far the opposite of that that you had no idea of what Catholicism was or any Catholic doctrines or anything like that we just simply had no there's no, con no informational content to it at all and basically what I've learned about Catholicism I've learned on my own bat and even my, my friend one of my best friends once asked because there was Christian brothers there. Please, can you know? Can we learn something about the Bible or, or something about the Scriptures? We don't, you know, we don't know anything. But we didn't learn anything like that. So the only meaningful thing that actually happened was one weekend. We sort of went away on a camp, and we had a bit of a kind of, you know, it was a bit of a kind of a focus group. You kind of sit around and, and talk about, you know, your feelings and these kinds of things. It was a, a very simple level. But that was the only time during that whole period when I actually had some kind of experience of feeling, oh yes, there's like a sense of spiritual sharing. There's a sense of a spiritual community or oneness which is actually happening. And that's the only time in my whole life as a Catholic, well, and, and even by that time I wasn't a Catholic anymore. I already decided I wasn't a Catholic. But anyway, you were in this group, but you actually feel, felt a sense of uplift. Yeah? And I actually felt the possibility of some kind of genuine experience of being uplifted and, and psychologically healed through a very simple kind of spiritual practice. It was interesting when I went back to visit my old school, Aquinas College in Perth, and I spoke to my, my old headmaster just a couple of years ago. And uh, he's a, a Christian brother. He was the last Christian brother who was teaching at that school, and he was retiring that year. He said they asked him if he wanted to continue as the headmaster. He said it took him about one nanosecond to decide the answer to that, and so he was out of there. And so that's it. There's no more Christian brothers in the school anymore. And uh, we we're talking about things, and, and one of the things he mentioned was that they had, uh, for the year 12 sc students, they, they put on a, like a weekend of silent contemplation. And so they said, okay, you know, just silent contemplation for one weekend, and they thought they'd get like 10 or 20 there's, you know, there's like 150 in that stream or something like that in the school. And uh, they thought they'd get 10 or 20, but they had almost all of the, the boys 
it's a boys' school, almost all of them applied for that. So it was like about 120 out of 150 or something like that applied for that weekend, and uh, which is pretty amazing, yeah? And they said they were completely, completely stunned, you know? But obviously that's, that's fulfilling a need, that's fulfilling a very real need. Not dogma, not teaching, this is what, you know, you have to believe or anything like that, but providing an opportunity for some kind of actual genuine spiritual practice and, and uh, a deepening of the understanding of what, I mean, it's a cliche, but what, what is the meaning of your life? And so it seems to me that this is the kind of thing that, that religion should be doing. Uh, and, I, and it shouldn't be kind of trying to dogfight with, with science about kind of arguments that were lost 100 years ago or 200 years ago and trying to pretend that the purpose of religion is to provide a better explanation for how life arose on the earth. It's got nothing to do with religion. It's completely meaningless. The purpose of religion shouldn't be primarily to provide social cohesion. Okay, if religion does that, that's fine. It's not a bad thing. But, you know, it, that's not what religion is about. And it's even not the purpose of religion is not even really to be doing charity work and social work. That's fine. If religious people do that with a religious context, that's fine. But that's not really what religion is about. Religion is about finding a depth of spiritual meaning and context within your life which puts that in a framework where there's some kind of meaningful possibility of actually a real escape from all of this suffering. Everything else comes from that. The social cohesion, the, the, the charity work, all of these things, they come from that. And so I, I think this is where we need to, to focus and this is where we need to make clear actually what is the, the, the special nature of us, of our practice as uh, religious practice. So that's my little talk for you today on that. It's just a few ideas I'm kind of tossing around in my own mind. So be very interested to hear some feedback on that, if anyone has any comments.